it's on. But, um, just wondering if anybody here has um, been overseas recently. No? <laughs> That's not really very surprising because um, we've all been stuck here for the last couple of years, haven't we? But, um, a couple of years ago, just before we were all stuck here, my work offered me the chance to go overseas and I thought that sounded pretty exciting, so I just um, I jumped at it and um, I said, sure, I'll go. But there was one really big catch, um, and it was that I had basically about 24 hours notice to go. <laughs> and um, But I went, I, I just organised everything as quickly as I could, and I, and I went. And um, when I got there to um, New Caledonia, I um, realised that my hire car that I'd booked was a manual, but that's okay, I can drive a manual. But I hadn't realised that um, in New Caledonia they r r drive on the right side of the road, which I think is actually, um, to be very honest, the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and that meant that I had to actually change gears with the wrong hand as well. So I'm here driving on the wrong side of the road going around roundabouts in the wrong direction, changing gears with the wrong hand. And um, I'd left in such a hurry that I didn't have time to download a map or anything like that. Um, I had no idea where I was going and um, I couldn't find my way. So I, I pulled in to a business and I went in and in my extremely atrocious French, I attempted to ask directions and... Um, the lady actually shooed me away <laughs> like that with her hands and I just felt completely humiliated and <laughs> completely lost. Um, but thankfully, it was a pretty small place. So I, I managed to just get in my car and drive around and eventually find my hotel. And I got to my room and I sat there and I thought, well, at least here I can speak to myself out loud in English, which is pretty good. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I just sort of thought about my situation and I realised that here I was in a foreign country. Um, the reason that I'd gone there so quickly was that there was a project going on and they offered that if we came straight away, we could set up a sampler as part of their project. Um, so I'd rushed over there, but my boss had told me it's not worth going to set up one sampler. I need you to set up five. Um, and I had permission for one. And the other four had to be all in very strategic locations. So I couldn't just put them anywhere, but I had no contacts. I had very atrocious language skills and I had three days to do this in. So I basically realised I was, I was a bit stuffed. Um, there was just no way I could do this. So I prayed um, and asked God for help. And one of the things I had managed to do before I left Australia was to email um, not email, just message people online that I'd found that I thought might be able to be helpful. And one lady was a beekeeper who advertised her business online. I just thought, I'll message her, why not? And she replied and she came and met me at my hotel on that first day. And she greeted me with a kiss, very French. And she took me for coffee. And um, I soon realised that this beautiful lady, Sylvie, didn't speak really any more English then I spoke French, but she was just such a beautiful person with such a willing kind of heart to understand me and to want to help me that she just sat there in this cafe and rang people until she found the person who could help me. And they helped me so much that um, I actually had time left at the end. I got slides. Where do I point? <laughs> Sorry. I had enough time left at the end to um, go riding across New Caledonia in her beat up old truck with her uh, looking at bees, which was really awesome. And um, it just showed me what, you know, God can do for us when we ask. But I really, I could have refused Sylvie's help when she started ringing people. I said, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll be okay. But I, I really realised that there was just absolutely no way that I could ever um, achieve this, um, this task on my own, um, especially not given my circumstances. Uh, and yet Sylvie, this lovely lady, she knew, 
New Caledonia. She was from there. She, she knew how to achieve what I needed to do. And um, I just needed to trust her and needed to, to follow her lead. And she really was the way that I managed to achieve my goals in New Caledonia. And when I got up here, I just forgot to pray. So <laughs> let's do it now. Um, God, I just ask that um, my words today might be honouring to you and that you'll really just um, speak to each of us from your word this morning. Amen. Um, you might be wondering why on earth I was racing over to New Caledonia um, like that. What sort of job did I have that would uh, require this of me? And um, I'm a research scientist, which means I do some different things in the name of research. And I, I just love researching things. And the fact that they pay me for it is just an absolute bonus. Um, but sometimes I like to research things that um, are not part of my job as a scientist. And when I came here... Uh, last year, um, I noticed that there was a lot of talk about the sanctuary. And so that's one thing I decided to turn my research to. And I started off in the book of Hebrews and had a, a really good look at what it has to say about Jesus as our great high priest and what, what he's done for us and what he's doing for us. And one thing I did there was actually to go through everything it says about all the different items in the sanctuary, um, different parts, and look back into the Old Testament and see um, the history of that. Um, and that was really interesting, and I could just see so clearly that um, God has given us in the sanctuary such a beautiful, visual, practical picture of his whole plan um, of salvation. And as I looked... Uh, through the rest of the Bible, I also discovered that in Psalms, uh, there's quite a lot about the sanctuary in Psalms. And I'd just like to mention two of those this morning. First one is from Psalm 73. And here David's having a look around him, as we might do today. Have a look around us and think everything's wrong. Everything's just wrong. Um, the world doesn't make sense. The wicked are prospering. Um, things just seem out of control. Uh, and he was really troubled by that, as we might be. But he says then that this all changed when he went into the sanctuary and he understood that God has a plan to end sin and to end suffering. And another psalm that I really look good at this. <laughs> I can't get the next slide. Oh, there we are. Psalm 77 says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And this um, really meant a lot to me when I read it. And part of what on earth does he mean by that? By the word way that's used in the Old Testament is Derek in Hebrew or um, the New Testament is hodos and it, it just means it's exactly the same as our English word way so you don't have to worry too much about that. So it can mean uh, like a road or a path like we use the word highway or it can mean like a pattern of behaviour or a course of action or a direction just like our word way and why I thought this was really cool was and you're wondering when I was going to get there I'm sure is if we look today in John 14, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And I just um, was kind of blown away by, by that because I realised that when Jesus is saying this, he's 
he's telling them, look, guys, for like the last thousand years, you've been day by day rehearsing in the sanctuary the whole plan that I've come to fulfill. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> this is what you've been looking forward to all this time. And if we look, we can see that Jesus actually fulfills every part of the sanctuary. He's telling them that this is all about him. Everything that they've been yeah, looking forward to day after day as they've gone, gone into the sanctuary and made their sacrifices and sought after God, he's here. He's here to fulfill that. And first up, we see that Jesus is, is the lamb that sucks. Oh, better give you a rundown of the sanctuary first. So first up, someone who knows they're a sinner can come and bring an uh, innocent lamb. The lamb hasn't done anything wrong. And they would put their hands heavily on the head of this lamb and confess their sin and basically put their sin onto that lamb. And then they'd kill that lamb, which must have been pretty horrendous to have to do. And then the priest would take that lamb into the first room of the temple and he would sacrifice it on the altar for their sin. And then there was a second room in the temple um, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And we've been talking about that this morning in our, our Sabbath school. And um, the glory of God dwelt there above the Ark of the Covenant and only the high priest could go into that room once a year. So here um, we're told in John 1... Um, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. When John the Baptist comes, he announces that Jesus is the Lamb of God here to take away our sin. And we're also told that Jesus, he identifies himself as the bread of life. So that bread that was in the sanctuary, he's saying that is also pointing forward to me. And the candle stand, the light in the sanctuary, um, Pastor Adam, a few weeks ago, did a great sermon on Jesus being the light of the world. So this is all about him. And we're told in Hebrews that Jesus is our high priest and that he is the one who enters into the Holy of Holies on our behalf to atone for our sin. And not only does he go into the Holy of Holies, but in Hebrews 10, it says that we have boldness to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way which he has consecrated for us. And the whole idea of the sanctuary was that God was dwelling with his people. And in John 1, it tells us that when Jesus came, that he was God, become flesh to dwell among us. And in that same verse, it tells us, and we saw his glory. And that word for glory is that same word that it used for the glory of God that dwelt above the ark of the covenant in the holiest place. So this is just all very cool, (laughs) I thought, at least. Um, And just as the psalmist said that when he goes into the sanctuary, it reveals God's plan to him to end sin. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan to end sin and suffering. And that second psalm that we looked at where it says God's way is revealed in sanctuary, here's Jesus saying very plainly, couldn't be more plain, I am the way. So we can see from this that there's a journey to be made. The idea of Jesus being the way means that we're supposed to be on a journey of some kind. And um, the best thing is, is that Jesus has actually made this journey before us. He tells us, I came out from the Father and have come into the world, and now I leave the world and go back to the Father. Um, He was always with um, God the Father before he came into this world. So he's left left his home to come here and he didn't just come for a visit. He was born as a human baby and he fully identified with us in taking on our sin. And, And now he's gone back to the Father. And the best bit about this, and this is written at least 13 times through the Gospels, so I think he meant it, is he asks us to follow him. So he's going back to the Father, but he wants us to come with him. Um, But this is obviously completely our choice as to whether we want to make this journey with him or not. But he doesn't just leave it telling us he's the way. He says, and I'm the truth. 
And Jesus, there's no purer representation of who God is. There's no better way for us to understand who God is than to look at Jesus. He shows us the character of God in a way that we can really understand. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? And what we see when we look at Jesus is self-sacrificing love. We see love that puts us above his own needs, above his own life. And this is an absolute contrast to the lie that Satan's been trying to tell us about God right since time began, that God doesn't care about us and that he doesn't have our best interest at heart. Jesus absolutely smashes that one out of the park with with his, what he's shown us. And he goes on to say, and I am the life. And Simon did such an awesome job of this two weeks ago. I'm not going to touch that. Um, except to say that um, our life is from God and we wouldn't be here for a moment without him. And this, all of this life of God dwells in Jesus and relationship with Jesus is how we, we have that life. And as Simon said, that's something that starts, it starts right now for us, uh, but we won't fully understand what that means um, until the life to come. And it's a pretty huge claim then that Jesus makes in verse 6 there, is that no one comes to the Father except through him. It must have sounded like absolute blasphemy. I reckon there was, I mean, we listened to it in a kind of Rolls office, but I reckon he really shocked people that day when he said that. Um, Because it is a huge claim. He's, He's claiming that this whole way of salvation that, they know God has and God's plan is all about him and it's only us who can choose to believe him or or not believe him but um, I I believe that to be true and if he's speaking the truth and if we believe that then we know that Jesus is the only way that God has provided and he's such a, a wonderful and beautiful way that God has provided for us to know him. So I've got a question for you today. And it's, oh, are you on this journey with Jesus? And do you know the way? I think that so often we, we try to deserve God. We try to be someone that God can love. We try to do the right thing. We try to overcome the sin that we see in our own lives and we might succeed for a little while and that feels really awesome it does but how awful does it feel when we fail Uh, it feels pretty bad the truth is is that we will never actually be good enough to deserve the love of God but the best thing is is that we don't have to be because there's only one way that we can be made right with God and this is Jesus and what he's done for us in coming and being that sacrificial lamb and dying in our place. So what we actually need to do is we need to just give up trying and accept his help and follow him on that journey. Trying in our own efforts is about as ridiculous as me in New Caledonia with my lack of French and my no map and my no contacts trying to get a job done. It was just crazy. Um, And just like I had to to give up there and accept help, um, we need to do that too. We need to, to take Jesus' hand and just choose to follow him. And if you're hearing this and you think, well, maybe... I need to do that, maybe I don't really know Jesus, then please, you know, don't go from here today without speaking to someone. Um, 
anyone that you, that you trust here about that. But if we're on a journey, then where are we going? Um, are we like the sinner that brings, that we know we're guilty and we bring that sacrifice to the outer court? We come to Jesus and we say, I know I've sinned. But then we just, you know, leave from there and go home. Jesus wants us to, to go all the way through the sanctuary with him. He wants us to come in the inner court. He wants his sacrifice to, to forgive our sins. And he wants to take us right through into the holy of holies where we're going to see God face to face. And um, in Revelation 22, we're told that that's our final destiny as God's people is that we are going to see God the Father face to face. And isn't that just awesome? And this is something that, in a way, starts right now. We have access to God right now because of what Jesus has done, as that verse in Hebrews said. He's made a new and living way for us to go right through to this holiest place where we can see God face to face. But in another way, we're not going to fully experience that until till the next life and we get to see God um, and I can't imagine what it's going to be like living in the presence of God like that for all eternity. There's a quote that I read that relates to this a while ago and this quote kind of you know irked me when I just read the first line and I got my back up before I read the rest of it and realized what he was saying um, the first bit says, no one will be eternally lost because of their sin. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Isn't that what we're told in the Bible? But then he went on to say, but because they refuse to accept the way of salvation that God has offered. And this is actually really true because we've all, all of us are in the same boat. All of us in the world are equal in that we're sinful. And um, so there's... That's not exactly, it is the problem. But the real problem is, is that God has given us this opportunity through Jesus. He sent Jesus and given us this chance to know him. And it, that's the part that's our choice, is we can choose to accept what he's done for us and to join him on that journey. Or we can choose to just stay where we are. But we might also wonder if we can really be sure, like these poor disciples, they're like, how do we know? How do we know the way? And Jesus says to them, my father's house has many rooms and I'm going to make a place for you. He wasn't guessing. Jesus wasn't guessing when he said this. He's talking about his own home. So he's speaking with absolute confidence in this, um, telling them that He's, he knows there's room for them there and he knows there's room for you there and for me there. And the cool thing about this is that when Jesus was saying this, at that time, if a man became engaged to a woman, what he would do is he'd make that promise, that covenant to her, but then he'd actually leave her. Sounds pretty bad. But what he was doing was he was going home to his house where he would actually build onto his father's house and he would get that room in the house all ready. So it was going to be perfect. And then he would come and get her so that they could be together from then on. And this is what Jesus is promising to us. He's made a covenant with us. He's, he's basically proposing here and saying accept this and I'll go away and I'll get everything ready for you and that way I'll come back and get you and you can be with me forever and I don't know about you but Jesus love is beyond any love that um, we can know and He's, he's shown this in being willing to, to give his own life in place of ours. And so I think that he's not doing a botch-up job of getting a room ready for us. I think that's going to be the best place that we've ever experienced. I think it's going to be perfect because his love for us um, is motivating that. But the best part about that won't be 
the place at all. The best part about that is going to be that we are with Jesus and that we're in that perfect relationship with him. And he's committed to this. He's really keen. He's really keen to spend forever with us. and He's going to do everything to get ready. So we might still be like Thomas and still question it and say, you know, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And um, I heard from a friend of mine a little while ago who's been a missionary for 20 years and she was expressing that she's still worried that, you know, you think she'd know Jesus, she's a missionary. Um, She's still worried she's going to stuff it up and she's not going to make it to heaven, basically. Um, and I think sometimes we worry too because we know, we know our failings. But Jesus is very committed to this and he's going to do everything to get us there. It's not like um, when those, that guy and that lady, I was talking about when they got engaged, it's not like she had to have a GPS to find his house. It's not like she had to have you know, a donkey or a cart to get there. He was going to come and get her and Jesus has promised that he's coming to get us the only thing that we have to do the only things his disciples had to do was to to know him and to trust him and he doesn't mean you know that we we meet him once at the cross and you know ask for our sins to be forgiven and forget about him he means daily relationship with us and so that relationship becomes a daily priority in our life, that daily we come to him and confess our sin and, and ask for his spirit in us. Um, and yeah, it just make that relationship something that really defines us. But one last thing is he starts this off by telling his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. And they were troubled. He was telling them that he was dying, that he was leaving. And I think if we're honest, we're all troubled. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe my life's crazier than the rest of you. Um, But I think all of us are troubled. There's so much going on like that psalmist when we look around and we see that everything's out of control in the world. Uh, Maybe it's the price of lettuce that scares you or how you're going to pay your rent or um, a war, or whether um, it it could be a sickness of yourself or someone that you love, or a relationship that you just don't know how to mend. But Jesus tells us, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He's not promising to take away everything right now. But just like that psalmist went into the sanctuary and understood that God had a plan to take away sin and suffering, Jesus invites us to come in and take a look, to see his plan and to see that he has come to fulfill that plan and that now he's gone away to just make those final preparations and that soon he's going to end sin and suffering for good and for us to hope in that. So I want to ask you to do something really scary today when I finish. I'm going to pray and then I want you to do something really scary. I want you to talk to each other. Um, I just want you to just tell someone that you're troubled. You might be able to tell them what's troubling you. You don't have to. There's no pressure to, you know, spill all your secrets this morning. Um, But just I want you to pray with each other. And just to really thank God that um, he has a plan and that what, for what Jesus has done. And thank Jesus that he's preparing that place for you. And if, you, if there's no one here that you feel comfortable talking to, you can come and talk to me. That's all right too. Um, but yeah, let's just pray together now. Jesus, I just thank you that you've provided me a way to God, provided all of us a way to God. And I choose to follow you today, God, and to live my life in pursuit of your way. I bring my sin to you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you that you've dealt with that and that you're guiding me on a journey to where I can see God face to face.
Lord, guide my steps every day and help me understand what it really means to follow you. Thank you, Lord. Amen.